Well, this morning we're turning our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, please. Matthew chapter 7. I want to read a few verses from this uh, portion of Scripture. Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to read from verse uh, 24 through to verse 29. In fact, I think what we'll do is we'll read from verse 21. It will help us in our thoughts as we go through this message. I, I'm mindful of the, the two weeks which have you know, gone into eternity and the need to build upon that from a, a, a perspective of going on with God and really examining our foundation and so on. I trust this word will fit in with the, the theme of our messages these last couple of weeks. And also, as we think ahead to our final gospel uh, meeting this evening under the mission banner. So Matthew chapter 7, I'll read from verse 21, but I want to focus especially on the, the last portion in verse 24 through to the end. So Matthew 7 verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the, the rain descended, and the floods came, and the, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Amen. We're finishing there at the end of verse 29. Now, as we turn to God's word this afternoon, I want us to think about what I've called the, the genuine article, or genuine Christianity, if you want to be a bit more specific. But the, the genuine article itself, it's a very recognizable portion of God's word. And I believe even the Reverend Higginson, in the course of some of his messages, may have referred to it on occasions. But I want us to think about it in close detail with the Lord's help in these closing moments. So do draw near to the throne of grace with me. Do pray and individually ask God to speak to your heart and soul. Lord, we thank you for this house of worship. It's a blessing to be part of the family of God, uh, that we can just strengthen each other in the things of Christ. And Lord, that we can come again to thy word, and even though we can say, we, we look back and we've, we've heard thy word and it's, it's built us up, Lord, we would be naive to think that we now can just go on and, and never feed ourselves again. We're, we're always needing to be fed day by day, week after week. Lord, build us up, give us a greater appetite. May we look forward with expectation. And I pray that for everyone here this evening, even if there is weariness or tiredness, or there are distractions here and there, that for this most precious moment of time, because Lord, it's only a passing moment, these are only fleeting moments, that God himself will presence himself. Lord, I need you. I need the, 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 the God of help in this pulpit to give unction and power and help. There is need for the infilling of the Spirit. There is need for clearness clarity of mind and thought and expression. Oh God in heaven, come upon us, we pray. Hear our cry. Lord, thrill our souls. May we come, Lord, and even leave this place this day testifying of the Lord's speaking voice. Even save, Father. Do something we've looked not for or even did not expect this day. Awaken us to Christ. Do a work we ask that would last for eternity. We pray in the Saviour's holy and precious name. Amen. I believe that, that this morning and this afternoon it would be beneficial for us to close, in, in many respects, our two weeks of mission by turning again to one of the, the, the Saviour's great statements and illustrations 
Over the course of the last two weeks, I was sitting down uh, earlier on trying to work this out for, to sympathize with you. You've heard, by the way, about 500 minutes of preaching. So if you want to have a, a ribbon of approval, well done, you're going to have this because we preach longer than probably we normally do. Uh, both uh, Roger and myself would um, uh, confess that we, we started earlier with time, we, we, we finished maybe sometimes a little bit later. Tremendous to hear the, 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 the stillness that was here and witness the listening that was here. But in all of those sermons and messages and evangelistic appeals that were made known, so many of them, of course, were, were, were bringing us to a place where we considered the very word and the person of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so for that reason alone, there is no greater place to turn to than the end of the Savior's great sermon himself, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. If you read verse 28, you'll, you'll see straight away the, the, the impression and the impact that this message had upon the multitudes that heard the Savior's words. In verse 28, it says that the, the people were astonished. I think sometimes we can place a lot more emphasis on that word astonished than the reason why they were astonished. You know, the reason why they were astonished at the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ is really twofold. And, and you'll see it right before your very eyes. In verse 28, <laughs> the people were astonished First of all, at his doctrine. Now, we must remember that when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, as vast as it really is, that the ministry, the preaching ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ was didactic, that it was, it was a teaching ministry. It, it was a ministry in which he instructed the hearts and the minds and the souls of the people. And I think that's a very important thing to remember, that when we've looked over the last two weeks as a congregation, and the church as the preaching of the gospel, the gospel by its very necessity teaches us. It, it teaches us about God. It teaches us about ourselves. It, it teaches us about the, the, the reality of sin and all of these things. It, it's not a display of emotionism or sensationism. It is a teaching ministry, a preaching and a teaching ministry. That's what was true of our Savior's ministry. And so whether the Lord used illustrations, whether he quoted directly from Old Testament Scripture, whether it was a portion in the Sermon on the Mount where he explained a misinterpretation or a misapplication that was so often common in the Savior's day of the law of Moses, whether he exposed error, whether he was entreating, whether he was appealing, he was always teaching. And, and the one thing that we must hold on to as a church and a fellowship, and we must seek to guard within the pulpit, is that with the evangelism, with the preaching, that we teach men and women. And we seek to give them an understanding of the things of God, just as the Savior did in his great sermon. And then, of course, we know the other reason why they were astonished was because of his authority. I think a Brother Higginson maybe mentioned this in one of his sermons he spoke and he ministered and he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know, the scribes had authority. You've got to remember this. They had authority. They had respect. They had a sense in which they could, they could um, command the attention and to some degree the, the, the respect of the individuals. But everything the scribes were ministering and teaching the Pharisees, it was dead, it was lifeless, it was flat, it was oftentimes confusing. And it just simply revealed they were saying things and they were teaching things that they themselves did not know or understand in their hearts. And know the great tragedy, not just within this country, but throughout all nations of the world, is that there are pulpits which are filled with men whose ministry is not just simply fat, flat and powerless and lifeless, but they stand there preaching things which they don't know, neither understand. And the Lord here, when he came on the scene and he brought the word of God to men and women and young people, there was a teaching ministry here. He taught them with authority. He taught them with plainness and with power. That's what you see as the conclusion of all things. There was a comparison between the Savior's ministry and others in his day. And when you think about that beloved this day, it's important to remember that our Savior's 
preaching ministry, and I, I, I personally believe this is a, a conviction of mine, that the Sermon of the Mount and anything that Jesus Christ did preach was not a collection of random thoughts. It's why, personally, my conviction is that while, you know, textual preaching is good, it is very necessary long-term for churches to go through portions systematically, that you build upon things. And, and the Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount did not just pluck random ideas or thoughts from the air and just bring them to people. That there was, if I can use the word and you'll understand what I mean here, there was a project in mind, there was a, a design and he said, well, how do you know that? Well, let me tell you how we know this. Because when the Savior first began and he dealt with the Beatitudes, so often misunderstood, so often misinterpreted, what, what are the Beatitudes? Demonstrations of what true conversion is. How the life of Christ begins in the soul. What is it to start as a Christian? Read the Beatitudes and you'll see one of the greatest pictures and illustrations of conversion that you'll read in all of Scripture. The whole journey of, of grace in the life of a man or a woman who will go from mourning and poverty of spirit to being filled with righteousness and living the Christian life. And as the Lord developed the great Sermon of the Mount, he, he was saying to people, look, this is how you begin. There's been, what, years, centuries of darkness and misunderstanding. This is how you begin. And my friend, that's what our gospel mission is really has all been about. That we can just say to some who have heard, and some may who listened online, and others who have come together in this place, this is what it means to start as a Christian, how to be saved. But you know what is, is just as equally as important? How do you carry on as a Christian? How do you live your life as a child of God? How, how do you do that? That's equally as important, isn't it? And so the rest of the Sermon on Mount is really along those lines. How we live as Christians in a difficult world. What we have at the end of this great sermon is one of the great illustrations, whether we refer to it as a parable or an illustration. In many respects, it matters not. Because the Lord is, is, is showing us here, by way of illustration, the importance of building on Christ. Okay? Starting with Christ and building and going on with Christ. That's what the Lord is doing in this great portion of Scripture. With that in mind, I want us to think about the, the, the genuine article, okay? The genuine article or the, the reality of genuine Christianity in our life. And I'll leave two thoughts with you as I finish. But I would first of all, let's think about its firm foundation. The firm foundation. You know, you look at verse 24, verse 25, and 26. These are words that we all know. And, and, and many boys and girls who go through Sunday school and children's meeting, the wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rain came down. You know, we know the songs, we sing the songs. What, one of the great songs in many ways. What, what a great truth. What a great body of truth is being taught in that simple chorus. Because it's, it's what Scripture speaks of. It's how the Lord Jesus chooses to finish this great sermon. Of all the illustrations, of all the things that Jesus Christ could have said, he says this. You ask me what Christianity is, what it means to be a Christian, how to start, how to go on, how to live. He says there are two men, there are two individuals. One builds his house. They're both building. They're both doing something. They both have an external appearance. Think about that, that there's an appearance here. But the Lord is concerned with the foundation. On, on what is the life built upon? And what we build our lives upon determines how we go forward as Christians as a result. Now, our Lord Jesus had previously shocked all present by telling them that not everyone enters heaven. Well, that's not quite what he said, of course. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, and you'll see it there in verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. I, I think that's a, a strikingly a powerful statement from the Savior. And, and, and a very harrowing one in many respects. You know, we might all be ready to confess and say, well, of course, not everyone goes to heaven. And really only a few people in this world believe in 
what, what we call universalism. Everyone is saved eventually in some way or everyone has some form of paradise. The reality is we, we just simply understand from Scripture and plain reason that's just not the case. But the Lord is not just saying in a very general manner, well, not everyone goes to heaven, but he really hones in upon a, a particular thing here, that everyone that makes this profession, everyone that says, Lord, Lord, words that we're familiar with. And it's not because there's no place or stress placed upon, you know, inward and, and, and outward fruit. You know, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, and appeals to their words and works. That's what Jesus would say. We, we've done mighty works. We've, we've cast out devils and demons in your name. Well, are, are these signs that we know you? The Lord isn't dismissing the importance of showing fruit and evidence We've dealt with that in that time we spent with James a few weeks ago in the evening. That's not the point. The Lord is saying here that the, the appeal and the assistance is not founded on Christ. Now you're, that, that's, a, that's a sure way of determining the reality of Christ in someone's life. You ask someone the question, are you a Christian? Are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Now you know you know that if someone comes back to you straight away and starts to appeal to what they are or things that they've done or things that they've said, that most likely it's the case they've never known Christ. But if we can say Jesus, Jesus only, and if we refer to the foundation that is Jesus Christ, then you can be sure that soul has a knowledge of him. Because they're not resting on self, but on the Savior, on him alone. And that's the very idea behind the Saviour's words here, because it is quite a confrontational passage of Scripture. It's designed for that very reason. And so the Lord is exposing and he's trying to reveal here on what are you building your profession, how have you started, and how do you intend to go on? You must have a firm foundation, and that firm foundation, as we know, is only Jesus Christ. And so what it does, it now begs the question, what is a Christian? How do you identify genuine faith and genuine Christianity as opposed to what is false and to be rejected? Well, the Lord explains it this way in verse 24. Therefore, because he's applying it through illustration, whosoever hear of these sayings of mine and doeth them. Now, very important we understand the words here. Whoever hears his words and does them. So two actions, two verbs, and they belong together. It's not one or the other. It is a genuine hearing. We'll explain it very soon as to what we mean, and a genuine doing as a result of. And the Lord, by contrast, compares it in verse 26. So that there are some who also hear, but they do not. Now, here's the difference. In the first instance, the hearing that leads to a doing means that the hearing is very different from others who hear. It's hearing with faith. It's hearing and believing. It's hearing and God opening the eyes. It's hearing and trusting. It's hearing and going to Christ. And when there is a genuine hearing and believing and receiving, there will be by nature a doing and living unto God. Because there are many people who hear, but they don't understand. And they'll never believe, and so they'll never do. So the Lord is drawing a very important picture here. But this, was, this was not radical teaching, remember. It wasn't new. Uh, it, it's established throughout the Scriptures. Even the Savior's own ministry, he emphasized it many times. You think of Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. He, he rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Always belongs together. Luke 6, 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my words and doeth them. It's the, it's the same uh, parable, illustration, but, but Luke gives us this more detail. There's a going to Christ. There's a hearing of the sayings. There's a doing of them. And he says, I'll show you who that person's like. They've built their house upon the rock. What I will say here is that there is a need for this scrutiny. Because when the Lord now puts this illustration, this parable before the eyes of the people, by all appearances, there are two buildings going up. There are two things going on. It's not as if the one on the rock is building, the other one is trying to build something, and just sort of, 
he can never build. He, he's got something there. Something's being, there's a shell. You know, there's, there's something to see. And that sometimes makes it a little bit more difficult because, well, they might look the same. Uh, and they, they might re, be, resemble themselves. And there's something familiar about them. Well, they've, they've, if we just use the picture of a house, they've both got doors and they've got windows and they've got tiles and they've got bricks. And, and, and you stand back and you, you think to yourself, well, by all appearances, they're, they're, they're just the same. And the Lord says, ah, but there's something more because now let's go down to the foundation and ask the question, how did they begin? And that's where, it, where the challenge really starts to come in. And that's where we understand what it means to do the word. It's a, uh, a hearing mixed with faith. God has spoken to us. We believe on him. We receive him. And then in obedience to that gospel call, the contrite, broken heart renounces all things it's lost, admits guilt before God, turns only to Christ, and consequently lives unto God a life that is well-pleasing in his sight. And all of it is erected and built on the firm foundation, which is our Savior. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. We know the verse well. Other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Cautions 2, verse 6. Listen to this. As he, therefore, as he have therefore received, that's the, that's the hearing and the believing, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk. So the firm foundation is absolutely vital. I can say much more on this. But the first part of our Savior's illustration is really along those lines. Our like and the one that hears and the one that does and the one that lives and the one that is mine to a wise man because this is wisdom. This is wisdom. That you build your life not on feelings or professions or ideas or philosophies or ambitions and hopes, but you build it on Christ. And you start with Him. And you go on with Him. And you finish with Him. And so if anything comes of our mission, and if anything remains as something of a legacy, that we, we go forward as a church and a fellowship, and may God give us help to go forward and give us growth and spiritual growth and blessings that we build on Christ. Don't appeal to what you're building, but rather Him. That's what the Lord is saying here. It's firm foundation. But then as we finish, beloved, it's thorough examination. You look at Matthew 7, 24, 25. I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Anything that's worth its salt, or anything of quality, needs to be tested. We all agree with that, don't we? I don't know if anyone here in the church works through products and you know, engineering or things which have been built, but they have to be tested. When I was in primary school, we, we had one of our projects. It was, I believe, the last year in primary school. And me and my friend, Tom, at that time, um, we worked together as a pair. And we had to build a soap dish. Uh, <laughs> it was a boring project I had in my whole life, you know. Um, bu building a soap dish. And I, I think my first question was, well, why am I building a soap dish when I don't particularly like soap in the first place? But that's what we had to build. And we, we built this little contraption uh, where... It was um, a wooden thing, and you just put the, boat, the, the bit of soap on it, and it would float in the water. I don't know why we were doing this. Don't ask the questions. Years ago. But the, the, the first time we examined it and we tested it, it was just useless. Capsized, sunk, it wasn't varnished, it wasn't sealed. It was, just, it, it was a product to be rejected straight away. And, and in every walk of life, we see similar things, don't we? Uh, buildings must comply with safety bills and acts to ensure soundness and safety. You hear about some products and they're tested, what, a hundred times, a thousand times before they're put into the public domain for usage? Because we want to, we want to have something we know that it's genuine, something that's going to last and something that's going to endure. Uh, on a more serious note, you can think about areas within the world, such as Indonesia, where you know, poor foundational work and poor building work 
has been exposed by horrific occasions when tsunamis or earthquakes have struck and really brought many of the buildings down to the ground. Now, we know that the, the tsunami and the earthquake is a violent thing, but it also just exposed the, the, the frailty of the buildings and what has been put in place. That's just reality. Our Lord Jesus reminds us here that what is built, listen to this because it's very solemn, what is built or what is professed to be built inevitably will be tested. And God will test it in one way or another. Now when we think of why the Lord said what he said, he said it because the scene in which he painted by way of illustration was a familiar one. The, the, the geographical landscape of the land of Israel meant that there were, of course, hills and, and, and valleys and, and slopes. Uh, and the, the people were no stranger to storms and rains and heavy rain and surges. As most of us are aware that the Jordan River annually would flood and swell its banks. It would become rapid so that all year around where there had been maybe dryness, water would sweep to the plains below. Now, with the, the volume of water that began to sweep to lower levels... Of course, it meant that, that homes were going to be in danger. And it was vital that when the surge came, when the waters came, and that's why the Lord gave this illustration, because people maybe had experienced loss or damage to their homes in, in previous times. And he could say, remember how it happened to your home and it happened to your life? Well, this is true spiritually. When the surges come, when the waters swell, the banks, when the rapids are flowing and the water's coming down, it's inevitably going to come to your doorstep. It's going to come to your feet. It's going to come to your life. It's going to come to your building. And it's going to test you where you are. That's what Christ is saying here. And so you had a number of components here, the building of the house, the foundation upon it which it was built, and the severe test it would undergo. Remember that in his closing words, the Lord Jesus is laying out here the test of true saving faith. And, and we've got to take the whole Sermon of the Mount into the picture at this stage. Because the Lord, through this entire sermon, has built in this great picture of what it means to be in Christ and live the Christian life. And he's drawn the lines. Are you on the narrow path? Are you on the way which leads to life? Are you discerning? Or are you among those who lay claim to their works alone and never Christ? Most possibly, and most importantly of all, when it seems all is against you and all is overwhelming you, are you going to stand and you're going to endure. That's what he's saying here. I believe that really there are two aspects to this examination as we finish here. It's an examination that will take place ultimately at the day of our Lord. Okay? An examination that ultimately takes place at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, why do you say that? Well, look at verse 22. The Lord's already referenced that day in many respects. Many will say to me, in that day. Now, what is that day? That's the, that's the day of Christ. That's the day of judgment. That's the day of standing before God. So the Lord has already um, weaved this little thought into the, the sermon here because the Lord is bringing these people all of these years uh, ago to, to that day that was far in the future, the day of, of the Lord himself. And that's the day by which we must live and measure ourselves unto. Uh, James says, so speak ye, so, so do as they that shall be judged by the perfect law of liberty. Well, that's at the day of Christ. That's what the scripture speaks of. The judgment day when everything is brought to light. You see, the judgment day when everything is brought to light is the day of, of flooding, the day of rain, the day of torrents. When the winds will blow and the divine beating on, on, on the edifice and the house and the structure and the lives that we've, we've lived until now will be brought to light. I think that's what Paul has in mind when you, you turn to 1 Corinthians 3. I won't go too far as I'm encroaching upon my own Bible study here. But, but every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, for the day shall declare it. That's the thing that the Lord is saying. The day, the day of Christ declares it. That's not to say that it won't be tried in life. It will, as we shall see. But that's the great day of examination. So how do you fare on that day? 
What do you appeal to? What, what will you stand by? Is it Jesus, Jesus only? A life lived for Him, by Him, in Him. If we build on anything else, it will not endure. The day declares it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. But I also believe the examination does take place throughout life as well. So when the Lord was saying about the floods and the rain here, in a sort of ultimate sense, it's the day of Jesus Christ, but there is sort of a harbinger here, there's a forerunner, and that is throughout the course of our life as individuals, there will be storms and surges and rains that will try you and they will examine you, okay? In many ways. And this is the angle that we have to contemplate, that one of God's methods to reveal genuine Christianity in the life of the believer is by trial in life. Again, I can't really think of a good illustration, but if something is of a strong material, if you try to tear it or rip it, there's pressure, there's exertion, but it will hold its own to some extent. If it's flimsy, if it's not saying what it is, it will rip, it will tear, it will be no good. Cast it away. Maybe from all appearances, from a distance, it looks similar. But when there's a pressure applied, when there's, when there's an examination that is made known, will it last? Will it endure? Beloved, remember that one of God's methods to, to purge us, examine us, to bring us closer, is to try us, okay? It is. I'm not denying the fact that Satan will go after you and tempt you in all manner of things. But, but, but great is still, the Lord will examine us. He will put us into his divine sieve. He'll shake us. Inevitably, much chaff will fall to the ground, but what is the Savior's will last? You know, you might ask this morning, well, you know, do we know all the reasons why? No. Can I, can I get an answer to, to every question I have? No. But you'll know this from what the Word of God is teaching us here very clearly is that what God is doing is, is part of His purging process to examine the foundation to know what we are and where we are. That's what the Lord is, is saying here. Now here is the, the harder part to the whole thing. And I word this very carefully. Many don't make it to the end. Many don't make it to the end. Do you realize that? And I'm not saying I'm going to single out a church or a, a generation and, and, and say, well, all of these people were never really saved. I'm saying this when you stand back and you survey the entirety of the Christian history. There will be multitudes that have never made it to the end. Because they were never saved in the first place. I think one of the, the taboo subjects that probably is true of not just our own denomination and church, but throughout Christendom, is, is that we, it's too, all too easy when someone has, has walked away, okay? They've made a profession maybe when they're young. And, and they've walked away and, and they don't walk anymore and there's no sign and there's no fruit. You know, it, it's, 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 and I say this very carefully, it's, it's easier and it's more comfortable to look at that person and say, they're backslidden and we want to see them restored. When the reality is, they're probably just not saved in the first place. That, that requires a lot more honesty and it searches the heart a lot more. Because that's precisely what the Lord is saying here in this illustration. It's not that they were both built upon good foundations. They weren't, were they? We know that one foundation wasn't a right foundation so it's not going to ensure. And so when it doesn't ensure, it testifies to the fact it was never built on Christ. Never on the rock. I'm not alone in my thoughts because the Bible really enforced this through John's letter, 1 John 2, verse 19. John says, they went out from us. You know, John could have been very tactful, very sort of diplomatic and said, you know what, they went out from us because they had maybe a difficult time and they backslid them. Or, you know, but they, they, they went out from us, but they were not of us. That's hard, isn't it? They went out from us, John says, they weren't of us. If they had been of us, John says, 
They would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of all of us. Their going out declared that they were never in. Never building that life and a foundation. I'm not saying it's always the case, okay? In case you, you get me wrong there. Many well, may well be backslidden far from God. Maybe even sitting here in church, that can be the case. The thought here is this. The believer should be in the possession of something that cannot be ultimately destroyed by storm or surge in life. You say, well, that, that's, that's too hard. Won't I be battered? Yes, you will. And won't bricks fall off and tiles off the roof? Yes, they will. And won't you have to repair some damage? Yes, you have to do all of these things. But it still stands. It's still there. And notice the two contrasts in closing. Verse 25, it fell not, for it's founded, it's beaten, it's tried, it's examined. But do you know what? I read verse 27, and every time I read verse 27, I find it harder and harder to read, because it says this, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And I ask the question, why does the Lord put that into the sentence? Why does he say great was the fall of it? And the only reason I can think about is something along these lines. You know, the two houses before any waters came would have looked much the same. But there was always the nagging doubt. There's just something there. Is that other one built upon the rock? Or is it on sandy ground? And, and people would stand by and they would look at these buildings and they would look at these structures. And by all appearances... Just something not right there. Just something about his position. Something, how it lays. Just little signs there. So how are we going to know? God, God sends the search. And the worrying thing is this. Is it is not as if the house collapsed in, in one go. That never really happens, does it? It's, it's bit by bit. It's little by little. And people who have never been saved, never are Christ, they don't generally just give in at the first moment. It's, it's over time. It's a gradual erosion. They're, they're disappearing altogether. It's one thing, it's another, until finally the whole house gives way and is exposed that it's been years of profession, years of profession, but no foundation. And that's why I believe the Lord says great was the fall of it, because... That hurts the church, okay? It, it's, it's a terrible thing to see someone who's been in a, in a fellowship or associated or made some sort of profession and it's been years and years and you just think, of all those years, surely they have to be saved, but they've never been built. My friend, I would say to you this day, it's better to admit this right now than just keep on going in that way. Don't get to a place where so great is the problem of never being saved in the first place that when you do pack up the bags and go because something comes your way, that it's, it's a great collapse. True wisdom is to get right with Christ now. Build your life upon Him. Trust Him as Lord and Savior and then build a life upon His death, His life, His resurrection. And so when the storms do come and they will try you and they will examine you and there will be those signs of injury, but you'll stand because you're built upon a rock which is Christ Jesus. That, my friend, is genuine Christianity, the genuine article. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen.